I uh, need to thank her for that introduction and sorry, get everything set up here. Also, the, the most important thing for me in being here was not what I expected. So I want to thank Pentair for making this possible and, and Tom for inviting me here. But more importantly, I realized I really need to thank all of you. So that introduction and what she just shared and talked about is not me, that's us. Because really the reason I'm here is because of all of you. And I'm supposed to share what it takes to create lifelong connections to the water. And it's not what I do, it's what all of you have already done for me. That's what creates a lifelong connection to the water. The, the ironic thing is, this is like coming home for me. This is, I started out in Memphis, Tennessee. I was rescued from drowning for the first time in Percy Priest Dam, which is a few miles away from here. I was rescued from drowning again in Chickasaw Country Club in Memphis, Tennessee before the age of eight. So I stand before you now as someone who did not begin the world of international waterman and marathon swimmer at a very high level. <laughs> it is because of a couple of trained lifeguards at Chickasaw Country Club that I stand before you now. It's because of my father who jumped in to save his five-year-old son who fell off the dock that I stand before you now. And while most of what I do is in the oceans now, and I interact with other ocean lifeguards, I'm a professional ocean lifeguard instructor in southern New Jersey, every ocean athlete, everything I do in the ocean or in the open water, started in a pool. And that's probably the same for virtually anyone who calls the ocean their career, or their place of competition or training. We started in a pool. And while we were talking earlier, what walls are you going to swim through, my aquatic beginning was so humble, I couldn't swim to the wall, much less through it. <laughs> I think that's what the drowning was. If I could have reached the wall, it would have been a completely different story. So really, what what we talk about these stories and what we do and how we create this stuff in the ocean. And Jay and I talked about this. And I told him that behind my desk on my bookshelf at home, I have my water story. It's a copy of Blue Mind, but it's also a, a series of bottles and jars like this with water in them. Water that I've collected from bodies of water that I've been in on or near over the last several years that were significant to me. Monterey Bay, Gold Coast, Australia, Denmark, American Samoa. So I can look behind me at any given time and go, this is the water that helped shape the story of who I am and why I'm here. This is water from Nashville now because this becomes part of my story. Those of you that were in the workshop yesterday, we were asking you to talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes and develop your personal story. And someone said, well, if I'm writing my story, why are we talking to each other? And the reason is because our individual stories are shaped by and influenced by the stories of others. Every bottle of water that I've got on the desk behind me wasn't because of just the water. It was because of the communities and the people that were linked to that as well. Jay talked yesterday about the neuroscience and psychological value of water. And what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the social capital, the social value of this. And the social capital of water is not necessarily something that's inherent in the bonds that hold the water together. It's inherent in the bonds between all of us in this room and our link to the pool, to the ocean, to the lakes, any body of water that we influence or impact. So again, my beginnings were 
just like everybody else's. My certification, in fact, the highest level of certification I received as a swimmer was as a minnow. So obviously, I, I, I don't tend to take myself too seriously. And that's my father teaching me to swim. My father, who's actually buried just a few miles from here. Nashville and Memphis, this is me coming home. This is me starting in a pool at the Mason YMCA, learning to swim with the YMCA program, and then taking that show on the road, and then discovering who I was. Not necessarily shaping my destiny, but discovering it along the way, thanks to the people that started it in Tennessee. I'm not an ocean athlete who grew up in California or surfing the North Shore. I was overlooking the Mississippi River, a bunch of soybean fields, listening to blues music and barbecue down on Beale Street. So I took the show on the road, and, and one of the places that became really significant to me was Monterey Bay. If you read Blue Mind or spend some time talking to Jay, he talks about the slow coast. Slow coast is just north of Monterey Bay, Santa Cruz, so kind of near San Francisco. And we look out over water, and we talk about this incredible, peaceful feeling. And if you look at that photo in the top left, that was my experience of Monterey Bay as you stand on the shore and look out. And I was a long-distance swimmer, and Monterey Bay became a significant body of water for me. And so, like any significant body of water, I decided, well, I need to swim across this, of course. And it's 25 miles. It's an area known for great white shark attacks, blue whales, dolphins, everything else. And the first year I tried to do that swim, I made it about six hours across and was overcome by jellyfish things that started about an hour into the swim and continued until I was pulled out. Um, jellyfish venom kind of builds up in your system, and by the end of it, I was not in really good shape. And then I decided that I wasn't done there. I wanted to come back and come back to that. And the experience was the jellyfish. And how do I train for that? If I want to come back and do this swim, I was asked to come back to help launch the Blue International Film Festival, which was exploring these adventures and connections and stories with the ocean. And so I was asked to come back, and I realized that the jellyfish blooms are seasonal. And so as I prepared for the swim again, I trained harder. But I realized that I was going to enter that water again with the potential of having jellyfish just like before. So I worked with people from Monterey Bay Aquarium, and we were tracking jellyfish blooms, and it looked like I was going to be OK. It looked like there weren't going to be that many jellyfish. Well, long distance swims like this, you normally start in the middle of the night, because usually the winds are calmer, the ocean's calmer. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm walking out into Monterey Bay, and swam for about 30 minutes and hit the first jellyfish. Now keep in mind, in Monterey Bay at 3.30 in the morning, there's not a lot of light. The street lights have stopped way behind you. And so I became, between the previous year and that year, became an expert at recognizing the species of jellyfish in pitch black dark based on the way the sting was applied. <laughs> <laughs> you could drop me in a tank in that aquarium, at Monterey Bay Aquarium, and I could tell you exactly which tank I was in with, my, with a blindfold on. It's a superpower that I only use when I really have to. <laughs> so, I started getting stung, and I'm going, okay, this is not going to be good. But we had a plan for that year, and I, I was prepared because of the film festival and that we were exploring what was out there and what was going on, that I was going to protect myself this year. And so I couldn't see anything. And when the sun comes up, I look down, and it is absolutely my worst nightmare. It is like looking at the exhibit at Monterey Bay Aquarium, but those are small jellyfish. The ones I was looking at were bigger than the kayaks. I pushed off of one of the jellyfish in the middle of the Monterey Bay, and it was like pushing off of a rock. My hand hit the top of the jellyfish, and it was like a rock. It was like pushing off of a dock, a solid piece. And so my wife said, look, you've got to put this, this suit on to protect you a little bit, or you're, you're not going to make it. So she tosses me the suit, and I begin to pull it on as I'm pushing jellyfish away from me, because the only thing worse being stung by jellyfish is actually having one in the suit with you for 14 hours. You'll have to trust me on that. It's not something I recommend you go and experiment with. There could be something worse, but I haven't thought of it yet. We eventually made it across, 
and it became quite the story. And Monterey Bay is part of the National Marine Sanctuary System with NOAA. And much of what I do is connect people to the ocean for their own benefit, for empowerment in communities, but also for the conservation, connecting us to the oceans to help preserve and protect that environment as well. So I stood up on the other shore and started talking and realized, despite being in the water for 14 hours since 3 in the morning, and despite being stung by jellyfish, even after I put on a suit, I was stung inside my mouth, on my face, on my hands, and for 14 hours I didn't take a stroke and not see a jellyfish. It was literally something I, I don't know if I would ever want to do again. Um, but I stood up and started talking and realized that this was just this incredible adventure. And I was able to make it across that second time because I was prepared, because I was no longer the swimmer from Memphis that couldn't make it to the wall. I was now exploring way outside the box and way outside the walls. But I realized that in my own personal journey to connect to the water and discover what was there and what was in here, I had a story to share about what was going on for all of us. And this is a bit of it with I National Marine Sanctuaries. I love the connection. I love the story that we can create around it about people getting involved and seeing what's out there. So we realized that what we could do with this connection to the water, this self-discovery, could actually be much more than that. And the swim was a success in that I made it to the beach, but the swim was a success because it allowed me to see what could bring us all together. And the common thread was this ocean, this aquatic environment, and this, this blue journey that I had kind of launched myself on. And, and as I kind of now go into some of the stories and things that have happened since then, I want you to realize that this is not my story alone. My wife gives me a hard time because people say, oh, well, you know, you swam across Monterey Bay. I always use we because every time I've done a long-distance swim or gone to a significant event like this, there's always a boat escorting me. There's someone that's helping me out. It's always a community. Never once do I feel like I conquer something or I, I win or I over. I become part of that environment. And I become part of the community that makes this possible. And I always use the word we because every time I breathe, I see my wife there. And I see the people that are supporting me right there. And I'm very aware of everything that got me there. So as I show you the faces in these videos, these are our faces. These are the people that we collectively have impacted and continue to impact. And I tell people that, because a lot of times people get hung up oh, on, on the athlete side of it. And when I was younger and competing, and I was a little bit more type A than I am now, although that's probably denial, um, I tell people that what's most important to me now is not what happens between the starting line and the finish line, but what happens beyond those. And I don't want to be out there and be the only one. I want to be the one with everyone else. So I say that what we do in the water makes us athletes, but this is what's important. I started this late. I didn't start doing these long-distance swims and this outreach until really the last several years. And I spend most of my time with this sense of urgency, feeling that if I had started this sooner, if I had realized this sooner, what more could I have done? So now I spend most of my time going, how do I help others kind of share and connect with the same sort of experience? You hear a lot of people talk about doing, oh, I was the first to do this or the only person to do this, and that's great. And there's some things that I've done where I've been the first, 
but I never want to be the only one. I might want to be the fastest in a race. I did a race in Australia two weeks ago, and I wanted to do well. I wanted to race well. I wanted to beat somebody. But I also don't want to be the only one there. Because if I feel this, imagine if we all felt that. The phrase that we use, and I'll come back to again in our nonprofit work, is three words. Passion, strength, vision. It's what we kind of try to instill in everyone, encourage. Passion to care. Strength to act. Vision to inspire. Those three words will not only get you to the wall, but will set up the opportunity to go through that wall and beyond that wall and take somebody else with you. Because it's not enough for me to be the only one beyond the wall. I need the rest of us there as well. And after swimming across Monterey Bay and going a little bit further south than Memphis, working with National Marine Sanctuaries, they suggested I go to American Samoa. American Samoa is one of the most remote U.S. territories, roughly 65,000 people. Um, it's about a five-hour flight south of Hawaii. It takes a couple of days to get there. There's only two flights a week that go there from Hawaii. And it's also the site of the most remote National Marine Sanctuary. At the time, it was the smallest, Fungatelli Bay. It's now the largest with National Marine Sanctuary American Samoa. And I was going down there to do a swim that no one had ever done before between about 10 miles between the island and village of Aonu'u to Pongo Pongo. And it was a section of water that a lot of the local Samoans were actually afraid of because of legends and talks of sharks and, and things that had happened in that body of water. So, of course, being the uninformed uh, white guy showing up there going, oh, no, it'll be fine. People were coming up to my wife before the swim going, we're so sorry that you're going to lose your husband. <laughs> well, it was, uh, she'd been around me enough to know that, yeah, it's, it's kind of just how we roll. Um, amazing place, absolutely stunning place. And a place that I went down to for 10 days to do a swim. It was about 10 miles, turned out to be the longest 10 miles I've ever swum. Water was almost 90 degrees. And if you think cold water is hard, try hot water. But I connected with that culture and that community like I never have connected to anything else before in my life. It was almost like I was meant to be there. So when I jumped off the dock in Aonu'u and started swimming, I knew that's where I needed to be. It's where I was supposed to be. And that's a picture of the swim about halfway through. And um, I come to shore and American Samoa, and, and many of you have probably read stories like this as well, underserved areas that are in beautiful, pristine ocean areas where it's temperate and mild and beautiful year-round, yet they have a tremendous issue with drowning. And so I, I did this swim, and it really kind of captivated everyone on the island. And I began a program at the governor's request. They were like, what can you do to teach us and share with us what you do and how you do it? And I went down there realizing that I, I wasn't going to be the guy saying, this is how you have to do it, and this is how we do it, and this is the only way. We wanted to build something that was sustainable, and it became uh, a, a vision, basically, of how do we embrace the culture of Samoa. It's been on the island for 3,000 years, and there's a phrase called Ba'a Samoa. You talk about the, the southern way or southern tradition. Fa'a Samoa is much deeper than that. It's a connection to the island, to the ocean, to the community that's from the soul. And how do we honor a connection to that ocean and knowledge and heritage, but then fold on top of that what we know about being on, moving through, and being empowered in the water? So we started a program, and in the workshop this afternoon, I'll go through some more details of some of the programs that we've created and how we've done it and the foundation for most of that. But we had this vision when we were there. We, we want to make this positive impact, but embracing this culture that is so connected to water because we felt that that was something to share beyond just American Samoa. Create something there based on a vision, 
but knowing that it could impact communities around the world. So I spent a lot of time, around this time I realized that my corporate job in retail and brand development and project management, I felt I needed to be doing something more. So from someone who was terrified of the water and couldn't make it to the wall to realizing this is what I need to be doing. This is what I need to do. First step was coming up with a mission. A mission for our, our nonprofit that we just started, but also a, a personal mission. And I don't really like to read my slides, but on this instance, I want to say it with the emotion with which it was developed. To positively impact how we all feel, think, and act towards our oceans. Not to change, but to positively impact. I don't want to change how you guys connect with what you do that serves the aquatic industry. We don't want to necessarily change each other. We may change some of the details of what we do, but we want to positively impact it. So we go away this afternoon, and we show up at work on Monday, empowered and connected to a larger community to make a positive impact in what we do at 9 o'clock Monday morning. Think, because we add knowledge and skill on top of that, and then act. How are we going to act to protect our communities, to protect ourselves, to protect the ocean environment? This mission is pretty much what everything I do runs through. And this passion, strength, and vision becomes kind of the driving force. I, I did a lot of work in American Samoa, and... Um, one of the ceremonies, I, I actually was made a chief, so I now am a Matai in American Samoa. So in addition to being a southern boy, I now am Samoan as well, which they take very seriously and as do I. So the, the tattoo work on my arm is actually my, my coat of arms. And the Samoans didn't really know my story about Monterey Bay and everything when they came up with my title as chief. So I, I'm a chief in the village of Aonu'u, I talking Chief Fuyava is the one that conveyed that title. So my Samoan name is Wila Sami, which translates into lightning in the ocean. But what's really interesting is it's also slang for jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> they had no idea. So basically, in American Samoa, I'm called jellyfish while I'm there. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things that, you know, certain things kind of define you, and this is pretty much what I'm stuck with. A slimy, stinging, painful creature that I can recognize blindfolded if I was dropped into a tank of them. So these are my usos, my brothers with, with Marine Patrol. And Marine Patrol, before we arrived, most of what they did was recovering bodies. They didn't get the chance to save people. And so in addition to working on a program to help the communities and the kids, we also spend a lot of time training Marine Patrol. And there aren't really any pools in American Samoa, except for this one. Um, they don't filter the water, um, although it wouldn't be a bad idea. This is not Photoshop. This is what it looked like. When we went down there to do our first clinic, we set the buoys up and we step back and go, yeah, this is not going to suck. So we began working with, with Marine Patrol and the program we developed because we wanted to take what we have. It wasn't important, it wasn't significant to make an American Samoa a minnow. That plays at Sardis Lake or at Percy Priest or in Memphis, but minnow and Samoan, there's a size discrepancy there that you just can't kind of bring together. And so the Tolotai, which stands for warriors of the ocean, ocean heroes. So what we began to do is teach what we knew about how to be in the water, how to move through the water, taking it to the villages and working both. We were working under a, a grant from the Department of Commerce, a community services block grant, so we had objectives we wanted to hit, and we met some amazing young people there. It was a strength-based mentoring program focused on adolescence, 13 to 21 the group that my wife's research focuses on, neuroscience, brain development, risk-taking behavior. 
knowing that that age group, no matter how much we tell them, they're still going to go out and jump off the cliff. Not necessarily because they want to push their parents' boundaries, but because that is when they're ready to start taking risks. And what we found is we can take this ocean environment, which is exciting in X Games pretty much by definition, build in these protective factors and safety factors, but capture that risk-taking behavior and channel it into a positive way. And one of the people I met when I was first down there was a guy named Tank. Um, in 2009, uh, a tsunami hit America in Samoa. In Samoa, and it's called a uh, Nalu Afi, which is wave of fire. So we hear about the tsunamis that have hit other places. And in 2009, I was there two years later. Some of the villages were still operating on temporary generators. They were still driving over temporary bridges. And you didn't hear a lot of fundraising on NPR or by celebrities about what was going on in American Samoa. But at 7.30 in the morning, without any tsunami early warning system in place right there, the village of Leone was wiped out. Went away to work, came back, the village is gone. Several people lost their lives instantly when the tsunami hit. Those that didn't lose their lives, their relationship to the ocean was forever changed. And obviously, when you see that type of destruction and devastation, a little fear comes up. So for the people in the village of Leone, that blue mind, that peaceful sort of feeling of looking out over the ocean was kind of taken away. Because they're looking out at the ocean now going, when's the next wave going to come along that's going to destroy everything I know and everyone I love? So we created these positive experiences to help them kind of reconnect with that blue mind, that peace and that connection to the ocean. They've been there 3,000 years. Tsunamis have come through American Samoa all the time in their stories and the history of that coming. But when it happens to you right then and right there, it's no longer a story your great-grandparents are telling you. It's something you just lived last week. So NOAA and National Marine uh, NOAA National Weather Service, there's now a tsunami early warning system in place to help protect the villages and communities. But the fear was still there, and, and Tank was afraid to go in the water over his waist. Uh, he was actually on his way to jail when I first met him, because there's not a lot of opportunity in American Samoa, very remote, and not a lot of outlets. So Tank, who was afraid of being in the water, of swimming across four feet of water. The first year I went down there, I did this swim. The second year I went back after working in the village, we created a, a relay of Samoans going in that same route. I swam next to him. So for 10 miles, Tank, jumping off the boat into the section of water that I was told I was going to die in, joined members of Marine Patrol to swim that same 10 miles a section of water that no one had ever really swum across before. So we didn't want to just teach Tank how to swim. That's great. It's going to be a big benefit to Tank. You know, it opens up opportunities for him in the water, kept him out of jail. But more importantly, so Tank learned how to jump off into 90 feet of water and swim. But more importantly, Tank learned how to share that, to teach that to others. This was our goal. We shared and helped Tank realize what his story was from fear to confidence, from passion to strength to vision, so that what became embedded in the community wasn't just one person who could swim, but many people who could empower, protect, and help others. Every time we designed and developed something, it kind of falls back to my retail expansion and project management. Okay, I know how to do this here, but how do I do it everywhere? And how do I make it better? I'm sure when you're developing a new system for treating water, new filtration system, you're testing it in one place. But the vision is how do we do it elsewhere? I'm looking at the posters out there. Those posters aren't designed to be implemented in one pool, in one center. 
How do they impact this aquatic community as a whole? Even people that don't even know they're part of this aquatic community yet. So Toa Olatai became the Legion of Ocean Heroes that we began to, to pilot and, and test in, in various underserved communities in the United States from, from Seaside in Monterey to Camden in New Jersey. Basically, the pool became our open water environment. We began to teach these youth how to swim through walls by staying inside of them. Recognizing that that power and self-protecting factor could come from the community and also could come from within. And introducing what we do in the ocean with junior lifeguard programs and surf lifesaving sports to create that excitement, that ability to take risks and be afraid, but win. Not only how can you do it for yourself, but how do you then teach others? And this girl was one of the ones in Seaside Heights and started out in the pool, in the classroom, lives three miles from Monterey Bay, three miles. One of the best junior guard programs in the country is, is in Capitola, probably 15 miles from her. But there was no way she was going to show up on the beach in Capitola for a junior lifeguard program. The barriers for that happening were just not going to go away anytime soon without someone stepping in. So this was her first trip to Monterey Bay, her first trip out into Monterey Bay. Put her on a, a board, and she and I paddle out and get about 100 yards offshore and look around, and her eyes are just huge. I mean, just going, this is absolutely amazing. She goes, can we go further? Well, yeah, well, I mean, I have swum across here. I'm pretty much familiar with the water. Absolutely, we're fine. We're going to stop before Santa Cruz, though. So then we decide to turn around and paddle back, and we're paddling back, and we're from here to that table from shore. I put my hand over on her, and I go, we need to stop here for a second. She goes, why? What's wrong? I go, everything's okay, but there's a shark in front of us. There was a seven-foot great white shark swimming along just in front of us. Saw the fin. Water's clear. I'm looking at it going, okay, this is her first experience in the open water. <laughs> we don't want it to be the last, both literally and figuratively. And so I, I tell her what's going on. I also know because I've spent so much time with Monterey Bay Aquarium and National Marine Sanctuaries, that this is a juvenile great white that has no interest in eating humans or people. It's just cruising around, and we don't want to disturb it. I don't want to go hit it in the nose. We're just going to let it swim right past. So I, I stand next to her and say, it's going to be okay. We're going to be fine. Sure enough, shark swims on, literally in seconds, and we paddle back into the beach. I'm going, okay, so... What happens next is going to shape her experience. She is either going to have a Peter Benchley Jaws moment and never even go in a pool again, or it could go the other way. So we get to the beach, and I check in with her. I go, how are you doing? And she goes, that was scary. And I go, yeah, uh, yeah. We don't always have sharks swim in front of us walking down the street. She goes, was that a shark? I go, yeah. She goes, it was a great white? And I go, yeah. And she goes, and we were that close to it. And I go, yeah. And I go, and it was doing its thing because this is where it is. This is its home. And we were doing our thing, but, you know, we were able to do okay together. And she goes, so I just paddled with a shark. And I go, yes, yes, you did. She goes, can we go back out? <laughs> I don't know many of the adult peers that I know that would want to do that, but, you know, risk-taking behavior, adolescence, absolutely, we went back out. Went back out for another hour or so and realized that that's the positive experience. That's the empowerment. Imagine if at 13, your first experience in the water was becoming friends with a great white shark. How's that going to carry over into everything else you get challenged with on land? And what we do and how we help others discover their story in the water shapes how that story defines them early to late in life. The Ocean City Swim Club 
is something we started locally because we wanted to create opportunities for everyone in our community to discover their story, to be part of the ocean. And one of the things that we do, and she mentioned, was I had already worked with Special Olympics International in Washington, D.C. to write the program for their international open water swimming training and racing competition, and had gone to Athens, Greece to oversee the first ever 1,500 meters for people with intellectual disabilities at Special Olympics World Games. And so I had already been working on how do we take what we know about being in the water and adapt it to anyone who wants to be in the water. And I was approached by a therapist, spinal therapist at Backrack Rehab Hospital in New Jersey, my sister-in-law, who'd been working with spinal patients for 30 years, and said, look, after they finish their therapy with us, they go home and they feel isolated. There's not a lot going on. I live in an area where we have 200,000 tourists in the summer and 10,000 people year-round in the winter. So it gets pretty cold and gets kind of lonely. And when transportation is not real good and it's hard to move around, um, being in a wheelchair kind of becomes isolating. So what started out in the pool, helping people learn how to move through the water, taking what I knew as a U.S. Masters swim coach and college swimmer and, and USA swimming coach, and saying, okay, well, how do we take what we know about moving through the water and adapt it to someone who may not have the same feeling or, or body awareness of others. Started out in the pool, and we didn't want to just create something that they could do once a year, because for something to make an ongoing positive impact on someone's life it needs to be sustainable. They need to be able to reconnect and re-feel that experience again and again and again. So we created something that we could do all the time. So in addition to Sunday mornings taking our adult open water swimmers out in the ocean. Every Sunday afternoon, we take athletes with spinal cord injuries out paddling. And we thought that we were helping the individual athletes. And we were creating these opportunities. And what we realized was we actually created three types of, of participants. Those that wanted to try it. You probably have this in some of your programs. Those who want to try it, just get in. I want to see what this is like. I want to drop into a master's swim practice one time. I want to try an aquatics therapy program, or I want to try an adaptive aquatics program, or I want to try aquatic exercise because I need to make a change. I want to try it. We had those. Then we had those that wanted to do it. Every Sunday, they were there. This is now their thing. They are out in the water. The community comes together. We're out on the water. We spend an hour and a half out in the water. And then we had the group that wanted to race it. And this is what I got really excited about. Because by making this an ongoing thing and a quality of life and connecting to community, we had those that wanted to race it. This is Josh, who uh, his accident happened about three and a half years ago. His, uh, there's no abdominal control, and he's about chest down. He took to this like nothing I've ever seen. On Tuesday nights, he'll join us in the pool in some 2,000 meters backstroke without any floats, any assistance at all. Just has incredible amount of power and began taking to prone paddling and so he wanted to race. And my experience was once these athletes are on the boards, there's no curbs in the water. There's no stairs. There's no doors that you can't open. You almost can go anywhere. And what I found was for the spinal cord injured athletes, Prone paddling was pretty much the most inclusive and incredible exercise possible. So this is Josh actually racing against other lifeguards. We didn't create special events for these athletes to race in. They raced with everybody else, and they beat them. And while we were originally doing this because Becky said, hey, I've got these athletes. I'd love for them to be able to do some stuff we realize that their story that we're helping them create linked to the water became something that was profoundly impacting the community as a whole. From the EMS responders that would come and hang out with us on Sunday rather than sitting in the center, to the other members of the team that would begin trash talking each other at the pool workouts on Tuesday, going, Josh, put away the noodle, or Josh was at 2,000 today, or 2,100. We pulled together and positively impacted the community much deeper than the individuals that we originally thought were going to be a part of it. 
How do we create all this stuff? What do we do? And it's three things. You know, I gave you three words earlier. These are the other three. Knowledge, means, and desire. To create a program that can make an impact and keep going, you pretty much have to have these three. And in my experience, I don't have all three at any given time. Launching a nonprofit, I can tell you most of the times I don't have the means. But we find ways to connect this. We find the partners, the friends, the access to knowledge, means, and desire so that this can come together to create new opportunities for people to discover their story in the water. I've been really impacted by surf life-saving sports that I came at late, ocean lifeguarding. Last month, I was at the World Championships in the Netherlands. Last week, I was in Australia. And we created the Legion of Ocean Heroes to allow the spinal cord injured athletes alongside our open water swimmers that range in age from 20 to 70 to come together and compete together, head to head, side by side, and on teams together, and really building this community. And it goes so far and has been so impactful that uh, this was a scene from Australia Burley Heads in Queensland last week. I had dinner with a couple of spinal physical therapists in Brisbane last year, and they loved the stories of what we were doing and introduced them to this company that makes mats and chairs. And in the 12 months since I'd been there, these are now being piloted and tested in Burley Heads in Queensland, the only mat and chair serving the Gold Coast, the most probably uh, visited tourist beach area in Australia. And as I look at these water stories and draw a lot from surf life-saving sports, I know uh, those of you who run aquatic centers, keeping and maintaining lifeguards is a big challenge as well. I also began working after this time in Australia with international surf life-saving, and the world championships take place every couple of years. And as we talk about pools, I've been talking about all this ocean stuff, we were surprised to know that the first two days of competition at the World Surf Lifesaving Championships take place in the pool. We don't start out in the ocean. It starts in the pool. Those are our first two days of competition. Actually, some of the most exciting events I've ever done in the pool from a, a long distance, from a pool swimming background. I've never been more challenged, more excited about a pool event than racing in the World Championships. But everything starts in the pool. Ocean lifeguards, surf life-saving sports, starts in the pool. Yeah, we're pulling mannequins off the bottom, but everything that we do in the pool, we take out into the ocean. Now, I want to kind of end by telling a couple of stories. And actually, I've been telling some stories, but I want to come back to my own story a little bit, my own journey from, from Memphis. And I had the opportunity to be a Rotary Exchange student in 1982 and 83 and went to live in Australia. So I got on a plane in Memphis, Tennessee, um, flew off to Australia without a cell phone, without an email account, without Facebook to post messages to my parents. And I realize now as an adult that was pretty significant, although as a kid I was like, risk-taking behavior. This is great. The Cooling God of Gold is an iconic event in Australia that lasts about five hours. It covers 25 miles of multiple discipline, surf life-saving sports, surf ski, paddleboard, beach running, swimming, all in the ocean on the Gold Coast. It's been going on for over 30 years, and it started out as a movie. They had this movie idea, this huge event, and then the event stuck. The movie went away because it really was that cheesy even back in 1982. So in 1982, I landed in Australia and, and saw these commercials with this guy, Grant Kenny, top right Advertising for Nutrigrain. Grant Kenny was one of the, is one of the greatest surf lifesavers in Australian history. And I got a taste of endurance sports by running the Big M Melbourne Marathon in Australia because I had a host father who said, oh, great, it'll be fun, come on along. Risk-taking behavior. I was 16, why not? So that's Grant, 1982. That's me, 1982. And this is the two of us in 2014. So from Memphis, Tennessee, the Mississippi River, Beale Street, and Pork Barbecue, 
I was introduced to surf life-saving sports in Australia, watched Grant Kenny on a TV commercial, and for 30-some-odd years, I thought, God, how cool would that be to do that? How cool would that be? Race has been going on for 30 years. I end up in Ocean City, New Jersey, not North Shore Hawaii, not Southern California, Ocean City, New Jersey, and I fell in with the wrong crowd. I started becoming an ocean lifeguard. I started creating a new water story for myself. And I thought, you know what? I think I can do this. I think I can learn I can do this. And so in 2014, the 30th anniversary of the Kulin God of Gold, I end up towing the line with Grant Kenny, the guy that 32 years later, and I thought as I talked to Grant, what our stories must have been over the last 32 years, and then for both of us to stand on a line, me, some guy from Memphis, Tennessee, with one of the greatest surf lifesavers in Australia, on the Gold Coast in Brisbane, on my way to becoming only the fifth American to ever do the event. And Grant went on to win his age group. I finished almost dead last in the event. Almost dead last. I've since gone back and done that race uh, again in 2015, in which I wasn't dead last. Um, and I just did the race a week ago. In fact, I practically flew here from Brisbane. And uh, this past year, I actually ended up on the podium, silver medal. Uh, the first American to end up on the podium in the Kulangata Gold. And going, I'm from Memphis. This was never supposed to be my story. But because of what you guys do, because of your story, I got to write this story for me. And this is, as I've gotten older, this is kind of what has is, what is driven that. I don't know if there's any skill that I have that makes any of this possible that we don't all have. I think the only thing that really kind of stands out for me is I'm really good at being afraid. Really good at it. I recognize it, embrace it, and realize there's two directions I can go with that. Either this way or this way. And most of the time I've gone that way. And that has shaped my story. Continues to. I've gotten a little bit older and I don't know how much longer I can hold this up. So, I <laughs> don't know how much longer I can hold this up. But I want to offer you a challenge. And I offer this all the time and, and I, I rarely have people that, that come back to me. Seven day challenge. We build things to be sustainable. To reconnect to feelings so it becomes something that's ongoing. And so if anything I've said has resonated, and Jay and I are going to be talking more about the blue mind and blue journey and your story this morning, and then I'm going to be doing a, a workshop in which I talk about this a little bit more in detail this afternoon, email me, seven days. Or, if it's got nothing to do with me, but it's someone you met in a session yesterday, or that you're going to meet this morning, Someone from a lot further away than you ever would have expected. Someone you didn't know before, but that you had some sort of connection. Don't make it a Facebook like or an Instagram like. Email them. Connect with that. Connect with me. Let me know. Because we're going to go back to our jobs Monday morning, and we're going to remember maybe those words. It was like, Passion was one of them, and uh, strength. What was the other? So email me that. Email someone else that's made an impact in this two or three days. We empower each other. The reason we told our stories before you wrote your own story was so that your story becomes deeper and richer and stronger and more capable of guiding what you can do. So, again, this isn't really a keynote address for me. This is a State of the Union address. You want to know 
what your jobs do, what your company does, what your heritage is, it's everything I just showed you. And this is just starting. I'm making this up as I go along. I'm still writing this story. Jay's writing another book. We're just getting started. This is a state of the union. This is why I need all of you. This is why it's a legion and not a single hero. Passion to care, strength to act, vision to inspire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.